Hello and welcome to the Oregonian Sports Podcast. I'm Bill Orham, joined by Brenna Green. Brenna, Portland as a sports town has forever changed. No longer are we just a major league city in, with a an NBA franchise, an MLS franchise, and an NWSL franchise. We are now a major league sports city with a WNBA franchise as well. Um, long time coming, long anticipated, long awaited, long hoped for announcement this week of the WNBA's return to Portland. Um, a lot to get into on this. We're going to talk team name. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk the Bethals and their sudden rise in Portland sports. <laughs> Um, but Brenna, I gotta Portland go. I gotta quite, go. It's quite right. Uh, I mean, I mean, gosh, I mean, in in eight nine months, they've gone from people who, you know, obviously were known to the NBA community, known in the business community, um, were part owners of the Sacramento Kings, but no local ties in Portland. I don't think anybody would have said, "Hey, you know, Lisa Bethal Mirage and Alex and Alex Bethal are power players in Portland." That wasn't the case. And all of a sudden, in less than a year, owners of you know, arguably the most I'll say the most the most popular sports the women's sports brand in the world up until yes. at least Angel City came on the scene, and and now you know bringing the WNBA back to Portland. I mean, just what an incredible impact in a short period of time. Um, so we'll, we'll talk them. We'll talk name. We're going to talk Oregon Oregon State football. I know it's a week ago, but the Ducks are on a bye, and we're going to at least take a look back on that and some of the key takeaways. But Brenna. I gotta we kind of had to wait to do this podcast too. Just you know. Yep. Yep. There was some. There was some thinking that there was going to be an announcement this week, and uh, here we are. But I, I do want to go back to the days of two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two. Mm-hmm. Little Brenna running around. Um, what do you remember about the WNBA's previous uh, time in Portland? Yeah, I was um, lucky, I guess, because I was friends with. Uh, someone whose mom worked at Adidas. So she would get tickets through Adidas all the time to these games. Um, so I-, I went to a fair amount of Portland fire games with one of my friends. And, you know, I, I said this, um, I said this online, but I remember um, being, you know, I mean, that's, you know, you're in first, second, third grade around those times. Sure. And, um, you know, you'd go out to recess and all the girls would play tetherball and four square and all the guys would play basketball. And it was not, you know, and I guess football, I didn't really participate in the football part of it, which, you know, looking back, playing football on um, concrete is an int- was an interesting decision. But, uh, you know, that's what you did back in the early yeah. 2000s. So, um, you know, I, I remember... It was very strictly like all boys playing basketball. Um, the girls didn't play. And I, I, I will totally give credit to my friend, Shannon Taylor, who is absolutely not listening to this, but still does live in Portland. Shout, shout out, Shannon. Shout out, Shannon. Um, she was the first one to be like, well, I want to play basketball. Mm-hmm. And I can almost 100% tell you that it was because of the portland fire that she kind of got the idea that she was like well i could do this and then you know i i started going to portland fire games with her and i was like well why can't i play in the basketball games too and so it was basically like her and i maybe like one other person who were like okay we're gonna play basketball with the boys um and so that was like such a huge transformative moment for me i actually didn't end up playing basketball like competitively until fifth grade um but uh you know it was it's one of those things and i i was sitting there on wednesday and i was looking up in the boxes and you know i don't you know who knows if it was the i remember it being one of the corner like corner boxes and so i'm like i don't know if i'm looking at the right one or not but like i had a moment where i just kind of got emotional because it was like man 22 years ago and now we're finally here. We have been waiting for this for so long, and we're finally here. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's a day that, you know, I've i have been waiting for for a really long time. And um, a day that I, you know, I just really appreciated. And last year, having it be ripped away from us, like the way it was, was just so cruel. Like... <laughs> 
because everyone felt like it was going to happen. And then to have it all fall apart the way it did was just like, oh my gosh, is this, is this ever going to happen? Like, is this really ever going to happen? And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, we're here. So, um, yeah, just, uh, just a day that, that meant a lot to me personally as somebody who was the target demographic for the Portland Mm -hmm. fire for sure. So, so yeah, those are, those are my thoughts on, on what the day was like. What about you? Well, I, I went to a couple of fire games as a kid as well. And, um, I, you know, I obviously loved basketball as a kid. I was a huge Blazers fan, like so many of us who grew up in the state and more basketball was a good thing. And, um, when it really clicked for me is I remember watching the, um, the women's NCAA tournament in 2000, I want to say when Jackie Stiles set the, um, the women's scoring record Mm -hmm. in, in uh, women's college basketball with Southwest Missouri state. And I loved watching Jackie Stiles, the ponytail assassin, take Southwest Missouri state to the final four, which was incredible. And then the fire ended up drafting her. And, and so her being in Portland was a huge connection for me. I was a huge Jackie Stiles fan. I actually had an opportunity to interview her on this podcast about a year and a half ago when her documentary came out. And that was a thrill. And we talked at the time about the potential of bringing, you know, a WNBA franchise back. And at the time, like that was the fall of 2022, you know, we hadn't really heard about the efforts that were kind of underway at that point. So, you know, really fond memories of those games. I, I, I remember my aunt who, you know, always would give me like blazer tickets for Christmas and and things like that, got us tickets to a fire game and we sat courtside. It was the only time that my family ever sat courtside at a game and Mm -hmm. sat on one of the baselines. And, you know, that was an incredible thrill. Um, And I remember going home and like we taped the game like on VHS so I could see myself (laughs) on TV. It was a big deal. But the games in those days, Brenna, were on Lifetime you know, television for women, which feels like such an anachronism in terms of like how we thought about women's sports 20 years ago, where the only, the only place you would broadcast WNBA games was on the channel that also gave you the golden girls and designing women. And I, I am so grateful that now we're in a place where, you know, women's sports are, are mainstream and can be recognized on merits and not just as programming for women. And, you know, I think that that's the key difference of looking at this announcement versus then like this, you know, this is a, you know, in 2000, I'd have to go back to be certain about this, but you know, the WNBA was in its nascent days. It was not, um, you know, it had not really found its footing. We'd seen women's sports leagues, you know, fail more often than not, you know, the Portland power had, had folded only a couple of years ago in the ABL, you know, there was no certainty of kind of, what the actual runway for the WNBA was going to be. Now, here we are 20, you know, 28 years into the league. And with the incredible boom and rise, like this is a league that you want your city to be part of. You want it to be in, like you want to be a part of kind of the, the, the movement and the moment. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, um, I think it's been meaningful to hear Alex Bethal talk about, you know, the WNBA as a rocket ship, you know, which is, certainly a business term, which if I was going to invest $125 million, you know, like I'd feel pretty good about investing in the WNBA right now. So there's like a very clear, like business motivation for doing Mm -hmm. this, but also you are bringing something that is exploding in terms of, you know, you know, cultural awareness and and penetration. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great for Portland and, you know, you know, we can talk about all the, the factors of this, but, you know, Portland is coming out of, you know, the, some of the roughest years in its modern history. And to have, you know, a league, a professional sports league say, no, we want to be in Portland. We want to be in the center of Portland with, with a team, I think is, is hugely meaningful. And it just shows that somebody believes in Portland and not just the WNBA, but the Bethals who don't have local ties here have now invested in Portland twice this year. You know, I mean, have put in a hundred and uh, uh, eighty plus million of their own money into Portland, into you know becoming you know shareholders of the city. I think is is really meaningful. So I mean, just tons, tons to sort of unpack with the team arriving. But I do think about it in kind of those big picture ways of what it means for the city to have the team here and what it means mm-hmm. for you know girls and not just girls. You know, going back to Jackie Styles. You know, that's the first time I remember watching a women's basketball game and getting so pumped up. You know, I was probably 13, I'm a little older than you. And um, and going out and shooting on my basketball hoop on the gravel and, like, pretending I was Jackie Styles because she was that good. So, 
you know, I think your know, visibility and and presence is so important to the next generation. I think it's great for Portland and and the children of today to have to have this team here starting in 2026. And you know, just for me, just picking back, piggybacking off of that Jackie Styles point, like, you know, little Brenna, like, I look like Jackie Styles. You know, I could it, like, and even like yeah. down to like, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not big. I'm mm-hmm. I mean, I guess I'm taller than probably the average woman, but I'm not I'm not that tall. And Jackie Styles was kind of the same. You know, I'm I'm five yeah. seven on a good day. So like, yeah. you know, just being able to see someone that looks like you in person, right, doing these things is a big deal, and it made mm-hmm. me feel like okay, well. Jackie Styles can do it. I love Jackie Styles. Maybe I can be like Jackie Styles. And you know, I obviously was not the, uh, I I was not I was not at the level of that. Um, but you know, like that that's that's something that you know definitely kind of gets in your brain around that time. So yeah, I th- I think it's absolutely ginormous for um for little girls in this city to say the least. Uh, do you want to talk name? Do you yeah. have a, do you have a, I mean, do you want to talk specifics or do you want to talk concept? Because I do think there's two conversations here about what a name should, there's, there's ideas for Please names, but I also think there's a conversation. expand on what you mean by that. Well, okay. So like there's, there's a lot of ways to think about a team name, right? Like, is it, is it just supposed to be something that people are going to be able to rally behind and connect to, you know, that feels local, like, you know. Uh, the Portland Fire was was a good team name because it, you know, it sort of played off the Trailblazers and they felt mm-hmm. kind of like partner and partner teams. Um, you know, you know, this is the Northwest. Do you want something kind of quirky? Portland is a weird city, quote unquote. Do we want no. that quirkiness reflected in the name? Or do you think of it more? And I, I tend to, I would say, think of it more in the. In the aspirational sense where there is such meaning behind women's sports in this city there's such power behind women's sports that you know the Bethals have talked about this being the global epicenter does it does it almost need to be something more abstract and aspirational as opposed to like a lot of people have suggested the portland roses and i would say at first blush blush uh that feels a little too literal for the city of portland and kind of what this team is going to represent going forward so I wrote a column that I think you've read um, that had probably like 40 ideas and it ran the gamut. Some of them were more serious than others. I think some of them were quite clearly better than others. Um, You know, readers have responded with, you know, a couple hundred ideas. Um, Literally everybody has given their two cents on this, but I don't know if I've heard yours. So one, what do you think it should, what do you think it should be conceptually, but then, and then where does that lead you in terms of what you think it should actually, the team should actually be called? I, I, okay. Well, I like the Portland Roses idea. I do. I think that it pairs well with the Thorns. I think that it represents what the city's about. You know, it has it has it it relates back to the city. Um and I don't think that's too far of a stretch for people to understand that that are outside of the city. I mean, it takes five seconds to figure that out if you're like, Why are the Portland Roses? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, got it. Um, so I like I like that idea. Um I'm not, I'm not a big fan. Like I've seen a lot of Portland Swifts. I'm not into that. I'm not into that at all. I'm sorry. It's just, it's kind of like an, that is like an abstract concept to me. I don't really know what being a Swift means. And it just in today's day and age, like, I'm sorry. When you hear the word Swift, I think of Taylor Swift. Like, I just don't, I don't really want our, I don't like, it just, it's, it's, I, w- I wanted it separate, you know, um, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not into that one at all. Um, I've seen like Portland peaks. That's okay. I can understand it, but it doesn't really like mean anything to me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like I, I, I just don't. I definitely know I'm not on the Portland Swift train. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that you're, way. Fa- you're familiar with the, the, the Swifts at Chapman Elementary, 
and the birds, the swifts that fly out of the chimney at Chapman and are like a huge Portland. Yeah, uh, but that's not something that anybody else would think about. I mean, I don't, I don't automatically think about that. Like that's a one time a year thing. Like, I mean, during during the WNBA season is when that happens. I mean, I'm not I'm not arguing with you. I'm just playing devil's advocate of where yeah, that is no, coming from. Doesn't... And and then it does sort of represent, you know, it is. I I get why how people got there. I also would say, again, this would not be the reason to make the decision, but if you could have, I don't know, how many fans does Taylor Swift have? 90 billion? If you could have, I mean, if you have millions of Taylor Swift fans buying your merch and it becoming the unofficial team of Taylor Swift, I mean, probably that's not going to last forever, so probably not a great reason to do it, but... um, I, I see I see I see the uh the multiple the multiple uh the multiple layers of the onion there. Yeah, I understand the thought process. I just I I I just think it's important that this is something of our own. You know? And it but feels again, it feels kind of cheap. Again, if you were naming the team because there wasn't a swift connection or because the Swifts were not a huge Portland icon, which they are, again, this is not my favorite, but it it, it it comes from I a grew up place. here. I, I didn't mean... know about the Swifts growing up here. So there you go. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So Brenna's out on the Swifts. Uh, please direct all hate mail Swifties to bgreen at coin dot com. Is that your email address? I don't even know. But we're gonna we're gonna go with that. It is. Don't forget the e on the end of green. Uh, coin dot com. Coin dot tv. I don't know. You guys can figure it out. There's the internet. At Brenna underscore green on Twitter. Is there an underscore? I don't even know. There Find is. her online. Find her online. <laughs> Swifties. Okay. So I love Taylor, but so you are on the Portland Roses. I yeah. understand completely. I think it is a little basic. I think it's basic. Okay. I do. I don't think it's very clever. Um, I think that there's a I think I don't have a huge objection to um something playing off of the rose concept but i think just going with the roses is not very interesting and maybe this is like born from my you know love of wordplay and and puns where Portland i'm like it's just, no it's just not clever i don't think it's clever like i would much rather do something with rose city in the name and then something like alliterative with the with rose city like i hated what kirk brown favored when he was the um oh the presumptive owner he liked the rose city royalty which was part of the conflict he had with commissioner kathy engelbert because they did not the league did not like the royalty i do kind of think he was on the right track though with rose city and alliteration like i like that i think that's cool i think that's distinctive and i think that's branding i just think you need to be sure about what the the r alliteration on the actual team name is i you know, listen, again, I threw out a million of them, and I could talk myself into any version of them. I think the Riptides is kind of cool, but I also think that you want to be careful in this moment. I don't think that you, it, when, when the WNBA formed, and when a lot of teams came into the league, you saw a lot of names that were a play off of their men's counterparts. You know, the the Detroit Shock and the Detroit Pistons, um, you know, and I and obviously the Portland Fire, the Portland Trailblazers. Sparks. <laughs> Wait, well, Lakers yeah. and Sparks don't have that. But yeah, yeah. Monarchs, monarchs and Kings, uh, yes. Jazz and Stars, uh, Spurs and Silver Stars, um, uh, which actually was the, the Spurs, the Heat and the Soul. Um, you know, th- that was kind of a really convenient way to go about it the wnba stands on its own now i understand like institutionally it doesn't institutionally and financially it doesn't and the the nba is a huge obviously a huge investor or a supporter of of the wnba but like it it needs to stand on its own so i think that anything that actually is a play on the blazers um it should be avoided so like i did suggest like it's like the pathfinders i mean it doesn't really do it for me pioneers Um, pioneers is its whole thing because now we have to have a conversation about whether or not pioneers is even appropriate because lewis and clark has made the decision to to move on from being the pioneers which i wrote about earlier this year and i have lots of feelings about we don't need to get into now but i think it's a little a little much um we can have that conversation another time but um i think something playing off the rose theme works but like again 
this is Portland. And I don't think that a super literal name or just a mere mascot is enough for this city. When you talk about it being the global epicenter of women's sports, when you talk about it being a place with like, you know, real values around women's sports, I do think that something that sort of is more of an ideal being represented in the name and also being fun to say and also being a good team name. I'm not saying they should just be the Portland progressives or whatever, but you know, something around the, I, I did, I did, I did suggest the Portland progress. Um, the Portland pride was an indoor soccer team when I was a kid. And, you know, I don't know if we are open to, um, to team names that have been used by now defunct teams. I think the Portland pride is great on many levels. Um, with a you know a lion mascot lioness mascot um i you know where it can mean multiple things i thought i mean i kind of like the portland perennials because roses are perennials and like the the team would contend each year so that's kind of the train i'm on with with some of these like even okay like another one that kind of fits that mold again i have a million of them is I knew the, that when I brought this up pre-podcast, you were going to have so many things to say. <laughs> well, I spent some time thinking about it. Yeah. But like, but like, okay, we're a city, a river city with the pilots, which refers to, you know, boat pilots. Yes. Um, and think about like what motors a boat, right? What about the Portland Propel? Now, there is the water, and so I don't wouldn't want it to be confused with that that water brand, but like the Portland Propel, it's, it has a literal interpretation that is locally relevant, but again, it also has that sort of uh, aspirational pushing the city forward and like a movement. Um, so I think things like that, like I don't know, like I don't know if the, if we're if I'm quite there. I'm not saying that one of those is like for sure a winner, but I just think that when you think about like naming a women's sports, you know, team in the city of the thorns in the city of nike and adidas and of the sports bra like it just shouldn't be the portland bobcats you know and 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 oh, yeah and, and even like the portland power you know which i guess power and it, it, but like but you know you know the power of women and the power of women's sports like the portland power if we wanted to resurrect a, a defunct team name i would go with that instead of the fire um but anyway, that's how I look at it. If I, I, I will say my dark horse that I threw out that Ooh, you, you have gaining, a look in your gain, eye is gaining some momentum. Well, so th this is complicated because when people hear Portlandia, they think of the show and people in Portland don't love Portlandia, the show. Right. I get that. That said, Portlandia is a symbol of our city sitting atop the well, one of the ugliest bu buildings in the world, but atop the Portland building or atop the the entryway to the Portland building, you know, the, the, the copper sculpture of Portlandia looking over the city, holding her trident. And so I am a fan of the Portlandia tridents. I think that that would be a great team name. I, could say, I think it's a great team name. But I got I there by that. thinking about, well, I hate, I hate your idea. So okay. that's fine. Hate, it, hate is a strong word, Brenna. Like we can have a conversation without hating. Like that's, like this is not a podcast of hate. This is a podcast of love. You need uh -huh. to love my ideas. Even if you don't want them to be implemented, you need to love them because they come from a place of love. Hate has no room on the Oregonian sports podcast. Okay. But the, but the Portlandia Tridents was born out of also the poem that, that it's at the base of Portlandia that says, um, essentially, like, home is the journey we're all on. And, you know, so that, like, idea, taking that from, again, liter a literal symbol of the city, you know, the Portland journey you know, has, again, that sort of aspirational, kind of a, kind of like the Atlanta dream, but the Portland journey, I don't, I don't hate that either. So that is my, that is my, that is, that is, believe it or not, that is the short version of my thoughts on, on naming the WNBA team. I just would like to say one thing. Um, I understand your thought process on the Rose City blanks, but how many other teams in this league have a city nickname as their starting off point? Who cares? Uh, I mean, Golden State does. I think does. it matters for branding. I don't. I really don't. I mean, I think it is a, I think it is, there's an opportunity to be creative. Again, it is a quirky city. I don't think you want to be the, the Portland plaid, you know, which again is also in the column I wrote that you can read at OregonLive.com or the Portland punk. But I do think that like, you know, 
doing something that distinguishes yourself as something somewhat apart from, you know, the Portland Trailblazers, the Portland Thorns. Like, I think being the Rose City something is um, totally in play. And I would be a full throated supporter of that if it would. I mean, again, probably wouldn't go there, but like the Rose City raindrops. Like, I like the way that sounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would name the team the raindrops, but. Like the other one I said, by the way, and I think this is another winner. You're going to have to change the subject because I'm not going to. I'm just going to talk about this until like literally like my computer dies. The, the internet goes out. The world ends. The Cascadia fault splits. Like, I don't know. I'm going to be on this for a while. But um, another one I liked, by the way, is if you want to be like the perennials sort of suggests like year over year success, which I like, you know, kind of as a an aspirational goal. Um, but if it's if it's winning that you want to reflect with a team name. We all know that Portland Summers are undefeated, so the Portland Summers. Oh, you do have a lot of ideas. I'll give you that. You again, they're all, in, they're, all, they're all in the column at OregonLive.com. But again, like, there is, I would also say, and I understand this, and I know that, like, this is not my strength, but the concept of less is more, and maybe not to overthink it. So if, you know, if they come back with like the Portland Roses and it has some kick-ass branding, like, I get it. I just think it's, I just think it's a little basic and a little, I mean. Things I, I will know. not I, understand the Valkyries. I think like, I think the I next don't. level, the next level of, um, of, of, of creativity beyond the Roses. Um, yeah, the Valkyries, I mean, there is an explanation for it, like from Norse yeah. mythology and, you know, yeah. that sort of. And so I, I, I get it. I mean, it sounds cool. The flight of the, 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 the Valkyries, Wagner's epic. But I mean, you know. Doesn't I mean, really like, tell the, me the, 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 one, the one thing about the, Val, the, the Valkyries is that you, there's not another team that has that name. Just like there's not going to be another team named the Portlandia Tridents. Like, that, that, that is true. But I mean, also, you, like professional sports in our region, like, you know, kind of the the Northwest Corridor, if we will, the Kraken, the Tridents, the Valkyries, like all from mythology. Like, I don't know. I'm feeling like maybe, maybe like Portland can't afford to be the weak link in that chain. You know, like it almost like has to be the Tridents. Otherwise, like it's just kind of destined to fail. Hmm. What logic you have? Yeah, just, what logic just shoot, you have? Uh, Unfortunately, Trident is also a gum brand, so chew on that one for a little while. Oh, God. Y'all see what I have to put up with? Uh, would you like to move on? <laughs> I really shouldn't ask you that question, because the answer is no, right? You want to just stay on this forever? <laughs> I do, but I, uh, I, understand, um, I understand that we have other things to get to, so I'll let you change the subject. We have other fish to fry, my friend. Uh, um... <laughs> You, 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 what, you just gave me a look. What's, what's the look for? Well, I, I, I just thought maybe we wanted to also talk about the Thorns piece of this. Yeah. Because, because it's been a really interesting year for the Thorns. Um, yeah. By the way, quick, th quick thing about team names. Can I tell you a story that I may, maybe yes. I've told on this podcast before? So, like, in, when Merritt Paulson bought the Portland Beavers and Timbers in 2006, 2007, maybe? I was in college at the University of Montana, and he undertook a rebranding of the Portland Beavers minor league baseball team. Um, and oh, yes. he was he was exploring potentially changing the name of the Beavers and the color scheme. Ultimately, he just changed the color scheme. So they went from red and black to this baby blue that was whatever, fine. Then the team left. But um, when he was opening up the, the idea of renaming the team, there was like a submission process on portlandbeavers.milb.com or whatever the website was and I submitted the Portland Thorns I believe to this day that Merritt Paulson saw the Portland Thorns because nobody else could have thought of this saw the Portland Thorns in the inbox from that process and held on to it until he got the NWSL team and stole my idea do you want to know so, something don't take this from me uh, you've already told this story on this podcast before. It's a good, it's a good story, and I, I thought I might have, but it's a good story, and it's relevant to the discussion we're having. Um, but okay, so the the thorns have had a really hard reset. Bill, three, two, one. 
the Thorns have had a really interesting year in that, you know, the sale finally goes through to the Bethals. They're sold for $63 million. And organizationally, it creates a really unique situation because the Thorns were, as we all know, co-owned and operated by the Timbers. So mm-hmm. people who worked for the Timbers also worked for the Thorns. Thorns employees yep. were, were, were Timbers employees too. So when you buy the Thorns, you're buying, I mean, buying, you know, but you're, 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 you're taking over the team name, the team operations, um, the players, the coaching staff. But like a lot of the organizational pieces of it, ticketing, marketing, business operations, communications, is, is, communications is still the timbers. And so you have to like in a biz, in business terms, you're like standing up a whole new operation. Um, you're basically building it from the ground up. So even though the yep. thorns have existed for a long time, the, the Bethals have had to basically start at the ground floor of building a sports organization that really didn't exist before. And so there's a lot of adjustments still happening within the world of the thorns to this mm-hmm. new reality of being separate from the timbers. And I would contend that the thorns are in a place in sort of this new era of their history where, you know, they require a lot of attention, like a lot of hands-on attention because it's all kind of a new operation around, around there, you know, and obviously there've been on-field issues. You know, the team has struggled lately. You, you made a coaching change at the beginning of the year, ended up giving, you know, Rob Gale, the, the full-time job after an impressive run as the interim. Now people are sort of like, was that the right decision? Um, and, and now you have the, the new ownership of the thorns. Now their attention is fundamentally divided. Like now mm-hmm. they have, and granted, I would also submit that these are people who were not only owning the thorns before this. I mean, they have, you know, you know, like Raj Capital is not just, you know, in the business of the thorns. Like these are busy yeah. people who have their attention divided anyway. But now their focus isn't just on the thorns. Now it's on this new WNBA franchise. And I just think it's going, and I think, and I don't necessarily think I'm not, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but I do wonder what the impact is going to be on the thorns um, as they move forward. Obviously both teams are getting a practice facility common sense and word on the street would suggest that um, these will be share a shared operational facility. Yes. Um, and it of course just makes sense efficiency sense that the thorns will get some of those organizational efficiencies back that they lost with the timbers by having the WNBA. So you yeah. shared marketing communications, all those things we talked about before mm-hmm. with the timbers. Now you're just going to share them with the WNBA. So that all makes sense. But how does it end up impacting the thorns um, as they sort of adjust? And are they going to get the attention and care from the very top of the organization that maybe they need to um, adjust? Threw a lot at you, but I'm just curious how you view this move impacting, um, you know, an iconic women's soccer franchise. Yeah, I I just think, you know, I keep coming back to this. Um, The WNBA is only expanding on a certain timeline. Regardless of what is going on on the Thorns, the Bethals had to do this now or else they were not going to have an opportunity to do it again. Because we know that the goal is to have 16 teams by 2026. So I can totally understand why there may be um, some trepidation on the Thorns side about everything that is going on. Um, However... The Bethals did not really have a choice in this. It was either now or never to get this mm-hmm. team here. So I can understand why, you know, there could be some hand wringing going around that organization right now, just about the fact that, hey, like we have so many needs that we need to figure out ourselves, which makes total sense to say. But this was not something where they were going to have, they were going to be able to wait for a year and make it happen. Right. So therefore you got to just do it and figure it out as it comes, because if you don't do it, then you're not going to, then it's it's just not going to happen. Right. So that's where like my mind just keeps coming back to. Well, I would just, sorry. I just want to say that the flip side of that, like is that, that there were other viable bidders for this team. Like yes. it didn't have to be the Bethals, but from the standpoint of it is like almost kind of like how you have to spend money to make money. It probably makes more sense 
if you are going to like put stakes down in Portland, you know, roots down in Portland, it makes sense to create those like organizational efficiencies where you can have a marketing department that is uh, is working for two teams and as opposed to having a WNBA team over here that's run by you know, mm-hmm. the Monarch group and Kara Nortman hires a bunch of people. And then over here are the Bethals and they've got their own people. And then over here is Merrick Paulson. He's got all of his people with the Timbers. And then there's the Blazers who are owned by somebody, you know, they've got all their own people. Like it does make business sense. So like if, if, if for some reason the Bethals were like, Oh, this is too much. They didn't have to bid on the WNBA, but it ended up making too much sense. I just wonder if the trickle down effect of what is very logical business sense Imp- ends up impacting um, the thorns in 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 ways inevitable you know ways. But to your point, like yeah, I mean for the Bethals, yes, of course you had to strike while the iron was hot. The, the, this was the moment, and they understood that before they had even bought the thorns. Yes, because because <laughs> like because I mean I mean because th- they got the ball rolling on these conversations with Kathy Engelbert last October when. Um, we reported that the deal with Kirk Brown had fallen through and they were left without ownership, basically at the one yard line. And, and um, Alex Bethal, you know, was deep in negotiations with the thorns that was going to happen. But then yes. it's calling up Kathy and saying, Hey, this is who we are. This is where we are with the thorns. This is what we could create in Portland. So it goes from being, let's own a sports team in Portland to, and they probably wouldn't use this term, but like, let's create an empire in Portland, a women's sports yes. empire, or like Lisa said, epicenter by the way if you're from sacramento how upset are you right now like i know there's sacramento people who want a WNBA team and here we are guess what people who Mm -hmm. are based out of sacramento (laughs) are putting a team in portland um but no i you know i you know for the bethal like i i mean i understand your point of like hey another ownership group could have come through um but if you're the bethals you don't want that Mm-hmm. You want you you want to have both. You want to you want to mm-hmm. have both. So yeah. you know they 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 had to do what they had to do. Unfortunately, I I do think that there will be. You know, I think you're right that there is going to be some trickle down effect. Is it's just it just makes too much sense. Like you know you, you just you have so much on your plate right now, and there's so many things that probably need to be. I mean, I know that they said um, on Wednesday that they're planning on hiring 30 more employees between their sports franchises here in the next, mm-hmm. in the, by the, before the end of the year. So, you know, that's pretty, that's a pretty significant amount of hiring. Um, especially since, you know, those are not positions where it's like, Oh, you know, we're hiring someone to, you know, be the ball boy or something like that. Like right. these are like corporate level yeah, positions. The, yeah. These are senior, senior level jobs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, this is a big undertaking. Um, but yeah, I just, I just keep coming back to the fact that yes, the timing is not ideal for the thorns and that is really unfortunate for them. I totally understand that. Um, but there was no choice. Yeah. There was no choice. So, uh, team name. The Portland Peregrines after uh, Merritt Paulson's uh, <laughs> LLC. I mean, listen, the Bethals and Merritt Paulson are clearly on good terms still because Merritt was sitting front and center for the launch of a new women's sports team in Portland, Oregon. So um, clearly every, everybody's on, on good footing there. Yeah. Well, I was, I didn't think that was in very good taste, but, you know, hmm. that's me. Um considering and, and, you know what happened with the last the, the reason why he had to sell his last woman's sports yeah, the, team the, here. the reason the Bethals are in portland at all yes the reason uh, the Bethals are in portland are because Merritt paulson could not run a woman's sports team in an ethical way okay. so why is he front and center sorry uh, there you I, go i have an opinion I, shocker i thought it was interesting one thing that i'll say is um the Bethals are you know alex and then lisa and her husband richard mirage they are the 100% funding behind the $125 million coming in. That is, that is the ownership group at this point, just as that was the ownership group of the Thorns when they came into town. Mm-hmm. What did you see within a few months of them being in Portland? All of a sudden, created a conglomerate of investors, you know, really high-profile local investors and also people outside of Portland like Bryce mm-hmm. Young. Um, but Tim Boyle, Joey Harrington, um, a variety of other people, who are escaping the mind at the moment, but who was at the, the launch on Wednesday, 
Tim Boyle, Joey Harrington. And so while the Bethals are currently the sole owners of this WNBA franchise, I would assume that oh, yeah. a, as they move forward, you're going to see your minority investors bladder. come in in the same, in the same way um, and kind of build, build this out and create more local roots with this franchise as well. I think that that's just um, a logical interpretation of the, of the situation and also something people I talked to at the event on Wednesday um, expect to happen. So yeah. just something to kind of watch with the uh, future of ownership there. Okay. Um, we were hard both pivot. at, it's going to be a hard pivot, mostly because I don't know how I'm going to get back to team names with this change. Um, but I guess we will talk about college football. This has been a college football heavy podcast the last few weeks uh, for a variety of reasons. So it's fun to get out of that yes. bubble, but we can't ignore it entirely, Brenna. That's because last weekend we saw the 128th big football game between the Oregon State Beavers and Oregon Ducks. It was an absolute, what's the word I want to use? Um, actually, I thought this game was really interesting. I mean, it was a blowout. No question. It was absolutely a blowout. I just thought it was really interesting in terms of Oregon State's game plan, which mm. I think was mostly validated. Um, but just then also the massive, massive talent gap between the teams. Um, and uh, so it's 49 14 Oregon wins Oregon gets right and you know after two very discouraging games to start the season um they win a game the way you probably figured they're gonna win all three of them um but I I thought it was interesting in that Oregon State completely dominated the time of possession in the first quarter couldn't get in the end zone on their first drive mm -hmm. had a false start on fourth and one like deep in Oregon territory had to kick the field goal, had the field goal blocked. And then Oregon scored on every possession from, from there out until they had the backups mm -hmm. in at the end of the fourth. Like, the game was over when Everett Hayes' kick was blocked because the Beavers couldn't stop the Ducks the entire game. So I thought the Beavers had the right strategy. They just were so much worse, which we knew. We just hadn't seen the Ducks play up to their potential. So. um thought it was a really interesting uh affair but uh kind of an inevitable result what were your big takeaways from that one hello oregon thank you for finally mm. showing up for a game um indeed that was that was definitely my biggest takeaway was like <laughs> okay thank you like all right i'm not crazy for ranking you number three to start the season yep. like good lord where have y'all been um right. I mean, my biggest takeaway I, I said on TV was that um, no sacks for Dylan Gabriel. All right. We Huge. now have two and a half games because he did not get sacked at all in the second half of that Boise State game. We now have two and a half or sorry, a game and a half. Excuse me. Math. Hard. Um, a game and a half where he has not been touched. And considering the first game and a half that we saw, that is a market improvement. Um, so it seems as though Oregon has kind of settled their offensive line issues and, uh, it, it, it looks much better now. So, um, hopefully that will remain the same for the ducks, uh, going against a UCLA team that is also no bueno. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I do find it highly ironic that they start their big 12 schedule against UCLA. Our big 10 schedule against UCLA. And basketball is going to do the same thing with the schedule that just came out. The, 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 at least I, I, the, I didn't I think I, I didn't look at the women's schedule, but the men's, it the is, men's it's schedule. It is. on the women's so side, too. Also, so it's, I mean, it's like, it's all, it's a soft launch into the big 10 for the, <laughs> for the most visible programs. Soft launch. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I just, I, yeah, I, my, my biggest takeaway was a hello, Oregon, B, Okay, I think we might have finally found the right combination on the O line. Yes. Um, you know, in terms of the Beavers, like you said, it, it's it's something where we all knew coming into this game, it was going to take a very good game from the Beavers to make this all sing. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and that just didn't happen, and that's understandable considering the the talent gap. Um, yeah. We'll we'll see what happens. I am, I mean, the Purdue team that is coming in is uh, also no bueno. 
so uh, maybe we can get a get, get right game from the Beavers as well yeah. um, this, this it, week. It needs to be. I mean, anything else is going to spell trouble for the Beavers. I mean, they've got it. Yeah. I mean, they need to come out and handle Purdue. Purdue lost something like 693 to seven last week <laughs> to, to uh, Notre Dame. So um, I'm, I'm, act, I'm not as far off as you might think. It was uh, 69 to six or something like that. It was, it was uh, an Speaking absolute of get right games. <laughs> right. Right. No kidding. Um, I, 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 I still don't know if we know a ton about Oregon state because I think, I mean, by the I way, think you're how, absolutely right. How bad is San Diego state? <laughs> Yo, like if you, if you can go from shutting out a team on the road one yes. week and then, and then allowing 49 points the next week at oh home. mama at home. I, I mean, that is such a dramatic swing and, you know, it says a lot about the opponents. Um, but, I mean, gosh, that Oregon State defense. I don't know if I've ever seen an Oregon State defense that just felt so completely helpless. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, okay, yes, those, like, one-win seasons were not good. So, I mean, that's – but, like, a, a team that, like, was at least theoretically supposed to be pretty decent. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen that. And I really – you know, didn't sack Dylan Gabriel. Dylan Gabriel didn't get touched. Okay. And the Beavers had one tackle for loss against Oregon's first team defense. They had two tackles for loss in the whole game. And one of them came late in the fourth quarter against, you know, when Dante Moore was in a quarterback. The only tackle for loss was when they blew up a play on Jerome James behind the, um, behind the line of scrimmage, loss of four. So it sets up second and 14 and you start thinking, all right, Oregon state, like this is where other teams have had success. You've got Oregon behind the sticks. You know, I think they were down. What was it at the end of the first quarter? Uh, 10, uh, 10, seven, maybe uh, you're thinking like, okay, or 14, seven. Um, you're thinking, okay, maybe there's a chance here. Mm-hmm. 15, seven, because they went for two. Yep. Um, maybe there's a Good chance call. here. And then boom, Dylan Gabriel, um, Dylan Gabriel has the, um, has the 57-yard touch, touchdown yeah. run. And, th- like, that was it. Like, so, I mean, yeah. the game wasn't over when Everett Hayes' kick was blocked. That it was over when Dylan Gabriel um, went on the run. And if it wasn't over then, when it was 22-14 to 14 at the end of, um, at the, end of the, the first the, half, yeah. when it's like, again, the game is theoretically in reach, and you force Oregon to kick a field goal at the, going at the start of the third quarter, you're like, all yeah. right, the Beavs are down 25-14. to 14, Chew up the clock. You know, punch in, punch in touchdowns, at least keep it close. They go three and out on three straight possessions. I think they had one first down in there. Yeah. And Oregon scores touchdowns on each of those. Yep. That's how it becomes a blowout. So, I bet to your point about Purdue, if the Beavers are even a bull team, which they should be, yeah. they, should, they, should, they should be able to roll Purdue and get back to saying all the things they were saying coming into the year about you know, how, how good they can be and all that, because they're not going to see a team like Oregon again. If Oregon is the no. outlier, that's fine. Well, yeah. It just was like, God, they just looked bad. But again, like, is Oregon going to make everybody look bad this year now that they've figured out the offensive line? Maybe. But I need to see more from Oregon. I need to see more from Oregon State. Yeah. No, the, the, the sample size is not enough on either end. I agree with you there. So. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we have a a demolishing in Corvallis of the other variety variety this week. So, <laughs> will you be on Portland CW this weekend at that game? Yeah, yeah, we're doing post game show. So we're doing a post game show out of every CW game, which are all home games, uh, except for uh, except for the UNLV game, I believe. I think, and I don't remember why, but we aren't doing one for I. I don't remember why. Um, Talk about a game that suddenly looks a lot more appealing on the schedule than it did coming into the year. Yeah, you're right about that. UNLV's had a lot of success to start the year. They went on the road and beat Kansas. I mean, I think they're ranked in the coaches' poll, not the AP poll, but they are gaining steam. So going to be interesting to see where UNLV sits uh, come October 19th, 21st. Whatever it is, October. I'm taking it week by week. That's what you got to do in football season, baby. Um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah. So no, we will be. Uh, 
we're we're doing technically we're doing three shows this week so we're we're busy up in uh up in the coin sports department to say the least so so yeah and by the way i just want to add uh we don't need to talk about this in extensive uh terms but a big night tonight on the oregon high school football scene as i you know i know i'm a little biased but i also think it would be a big deal regardless jesuit shout out incoming yep ken potter if he wins tonight yep. will become the leader in all-time wins in the osaa which uh you know the man's been coaching a jesuit since before i was born so there you have it uh while we're talking about great coaching legends in the state of Oregon, mm. um, and I would also be remiss not to acknowledge the passing of Barry Adams, who was mm. uh, the dean of high school basketball coaching in the state of Oregon, um, Hillsborough, Glencoe, uh, South Salem, and and but I would but most importantly got his start at Nesteca High School up on the hill in Cloverdale, Oregon, in um, 1960. Actually, took my Bobcats to their only boys state championship game in the mid 60s huge accomplishment from our little logging town a legend in south hillman county and everywhere in the state of oregon um helped get the hoop up and running in salem probably more coaches in the state of oregon can trace their um their journeys through barry adams than any other single uh figure so um a huge loss in the state of oregon for for boys basketball and obviously to your point about ken potter's huge achievement appreciate the legends in this state because there's a lot of them and we've been we've been blessed with some pretty some pretty good figures over the years mm -hmm. all right time to wrap uh, it up yeah we're out of here thank you so much for listening to the oregonian sports podcast appreciate you listening sticking with us through this one um I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to come up with more names. I'm going to have more next week. Okay. We're just going to keep doing this. I'm just going to okay. keep throwing them at you. Um, oh, by the way, I, if we're, can we, are we, how do we feel about defunct team names? Like, is the Pride in play, even though there was a team called the Pride, or is that out because there was another team called the Pride 25 years ago, 30 mm. years ago? Like, what are the rules? I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I guess I don't really have any strong feelings towards that. I have strong feelings towards the name in I, not the name I'm just, I'm just i'm not a fan of that name um okay, but the, the other one the other one from it okay go ahead make which we have discussed on here before by the way so that's not something that is new the other defunct sports team name that i do like Ooh. is the portland steel the uh okay. portland arena football league was the steel for like a year so i mean like i mean who cares but who cares sorry, with, with apologies I'm to not, Terry, I'm not, i don't hate that one actually i don't hate that one s-t-e-e-l because the steel bridge runs right to portland yep. huge steel industry in the history of portland and again to my point about something being aspirational and like pushing the st st city yep. forward the i like the of steel metal and resolve you know those are important ideals for this city also yep. in the column that you can read at oregon live and in the print edition of the oregonian brenna thank well. you for putting up with me week after week nobody knows how you do it and yet you keep showing up and i appreciate you i appreciate that that might be the first uh, pun you've said that i like so congratulations finally got there finally all right brenna, got i'm it. gonna see you at Reese i'll see you at research stadium tomorrow night and i'll see you back here on the oregonian sports podcast next week thank you bye